I always like to start with an uncomfortable silence, uh, get that out of the way, then I feel uh, good to start. Um, I talk about these things a lot, so uh, it sort of seems boring to me, but uh, if I gloss over something too quickly and you have a question, please feel free to uh, ask about that. Um, hey, how you doing? Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say tonight. Maybe I'll start out with this. This morning, for the first time in years, there occurred to me the possibility of a search. The search is what anyone would undertake if they were not sunk into the er everydayness of their own life. And to merely to become aware of the possibility of a search is to be on to something. And not to be on to something is to be in despair. Um, so this is what I do to uh, avoid despair. <clears throat> in graduate school, this, see, this is my problem. I have no ability to edit myself whatsoever. So the only way I can talk about my own work is to sort of start from the beginning. So uh, I have about 198 slides to get through. <laughs> Uh, so here we go. So I'm going to go through them real fast, and I'm going to try to just talk about the most recent stuff. But um, it all basically started in graduate school. Um, I was pretty good at building stuff when I got to graduate school. I built a lot of things, so, and I sort of knew what art was about, so I could make these things really nicely. But after a while, people would look at my work and start saying, oh yeah, I've seen that before, that's art. All right? So I had to figure out something... Uh, to make the art worthwhile. Uh, so I was thinking about the idea of epiphanies, right? And these always seem to be times when I was the most scared and the most joyful at the same time. So when those two things crossed is when I got these epiphanies. Um, so I decided to do something. Um, I built this little 12 foot boat and I sailed it across Lake Michigan. Uh, in the middle of the night by myself. I'd never sailed before or built a boat before. Um, and I figured that that would do something for me. So from that came my uh, MFA thesis exhibition, which also became the beginning of doing these sort of trips and building these large scale installations. Uh, this idea of sort of embodied art that, that, that I would come back from these trips and I would sort of filter the memory through my hands to build these things. Um, <clears throat> and so this was the first one. Uh, it was a lot rougher. Uh, back in the day, and I, yeah, I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, so anyway, this was that. Um, so that seemed to work so well that I decided sailing across Lake Superior would be better, because Lake Superior was bigger and colder and scarier. Uh, so this was a piece that I built after a trip uh, across Lake Superior. Like I said, I'm going to try to get through these pretty fast. I've always been interested in boats, uh, primarily because uh, the way that they're designed, their aesthetic beauty is sort of a function of that they're made to function in the real world. They're made to go through water, right? And this is at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, uh, and it was based on a trip that I took from Annapolis, Maryland, uh, to Newfoundland, and then to New York. And uh, <clears throat> I had never been to New York before, and uh, coming to it from the first time, for the first time from the ocean was a pretty amazing thing. Uh, this one I was really interested in the idea that the, the structure of the water as well as the boat and uh, when I built the piece at the soap factory, the last piece I showed you, when I had all the boards off of the floor, I really liked the structure. Uh, so I decided to make it so you could see the structure as well. So this is where you came in from the back and you could walk underneath it. And I always have to tell this little anecdote. Is, um, I was up for a, a big fellowship in Minnesota called the Bush Fellowship. And uh, you had to have them come and see your work and... Anyway, so they came and saw this, and we walked up on the top, and the only place that you could see all the way through it is through the boat on the top. So they walked up there with me, and it's the Minneapolis Institute of Art, so they always have big groups of, like, Boy Scouts and stuff coming there. And so all these Boy Scouts were in their completely blue uniforms, blue caps, blue shirts, blue pants, and we're all standing up on the top, looking down through the boat, 
And all of a sudden, like a hundred of these Boy Scouts in these blue outfits came running through the back and just were whirling around underneath it. And then they all slid out the front and they were gone. And it was like this sort of eddies of water. I usually talk a lot about these, but I'm not going to. I want to get to what happened this summer. Um, this was based on the trip uh, to New York. Um, I remember seeing when I went to New York, I remember seeing um, pictures of the Statue of Liberty when it was being worked on. You know, they were rebuilding it, had scaffolding all the way around it. And uh, I was really interested in that idea of seeing the, seeing the sculpture through the scaffolding. So I wanted to build a piece, this is at Socrates Sculpture Park in New York, um, that, that would take a scaffolding to put up, but then I would leave the scaffolding there um, afterwards. Um, uh, all right, I have to say something else about this. Um, if, anybody familiar with Mark DeSuvero? He started uh, this sculpture park, and uh, when I first built this, it had it had structure all the way down around it. It was completely wrapped in structure. Uh, but when I got back from putting this thing up, drove all the way from Minnesota to New York, put it up in four days, drove all the way back, and I'd been back one day, and I get a call, and it's Mark DeSuvero, who it was pretty amazing to get a call from him, asked me if I'd be willing to come back and uh, do something because they, there were a lot of kids that lived around the park and they were afraid they might climb up it and fall off of it. So I'm like, sure. So I went, drove back out there the very next weekend and we rearranged it so nobody could climb up it very easily. But the cool part about that was he was so happy about me coming back to fix it that next weekend that uh, he let me stay in his studio uh, while I was working on it. And so... Uh, I got to sleep on this bed that was hanging from a giant sculpture inside of Mark DeSuvero's studio, which was a pretty amazing thing. Uh, this is a piece that I did at uh, Intermediate Arts in, in Minnesota, and this one was specifically designed to be handicap accessible. Um, it had double reinforced flooring. It also had the ramp going to it. Um, and, uh, yeah. That was at the entrance to Western Michigan University. Um, I was really interested in this idea. I followed these forms around for a long time. Uh, that were in that first piece. There's a wing on the end, there's a universal joint, and then a boat. So I played around with that for a long time, being really interested in how they related. They don't really relate in any sort of conventional, literal sense, but uh, they seem to make sense to me. So for a long time, I uh, played around with those. Uh, I got this grant in Minnesota called the Emerging Artist Grant, and. Uh, he had to be in the show with these other people that got the grant at the same time, but I wasn't really interested in having my work next to theirs, so I decided to build a room inside of the room um, and tapered all the boards uh, an inch smaller at the top than they were at the bottom, very gradually so you could barely tell. But um, when you got on the inside, uh, all, the, all the wood on the inside got correspondingly smaller. So. When you walked around, you had to duck down and look into it, and because of the forced perspective, it seemed about three times as tall inside as it did outside. Okay, now I got something to say. All right, so. Uh, I was using those forms for a long time, the boat, the universal joint, and the wing, and I'd been making things, and I realized I hadn't really taken any boat trips in a long time or done anything like that, but I was still using these forms. They didn't seem that relevant to me anymore, and so I asked myself why I'd been hauling around these forms for so long, so I decided to figure that out, that I would literally haul them around. Uh, so I started making these, what I called angel suits, so I'd carve these things, and they all had trailer hitches on the back of them. So <clears throat> I would put these things on. And uh, I would attach them to these sculptures. And then I would pull these sculptures around. 
So I decided what it would be like to literally haul the pieces around. Skokie North Shore Sculpture Park. This one's got all sorts of uh, really funny things about it, mostly because it's uh, 52 feet tall and we had to stand it up in one piece in place. And uh, we had to do it with my brother-in-law's Suburban. Um, so as we were pulling it up, I had to make this a functional universal joint right here so we pivot on that. So we had to lean it up, but we used nylon rope and a characteristic of nylon rope is it stretches a lot. So, uh, and as you're lifting something up, as you get it past 45 degrees, all the weight starts coming off of it as it gets more towards vertical. And uh, so we had it about 45 degrees and the nylon rope was stretched out very, very stretchiness. And uh, I told him to go forward like six inches, but as he did, the rope contracted and the thing just shot straight up into the air. Luckily we had tied it off to some trees on the other side. They have a great video of it somewhere uh, somebody's videotaping it, and then all of a sudden, as you think, see the thing start to go up, everyone starts screaming, and the video points down at the ground, and it's <laughs> running around, and, but it uh, worked out. Uh, this is another one of the uh, um, large-scale trailers that I pulled around. That's a bad picture. This is a piece I did for the uh, Virginia Groot Grant um, in Chicago. And uh, I was really interested in uh, this idea of mechanisms and, and this boat and how things made sense and didn't make sense. Uh, so this whole thing looked like it would spin around and as it spun around, the boats would also spin around, which didn't make any sense because the mass, of course, would hit the other boats and it would all just destroy itself as it, as it started going. Um, and it's sort of funny because I built this piece, drove it out to Chicago and I put it up. And even if they give you any money to go out and do these things, they never give you any money to go back and get them again. So I always, whenever I get done with these things, I have to call them up and tell them to destroy them. So I had to call them up and say, break this up, make sure it's into tiny pieces so nobody ends up with it in their garden or something. <clears throat> this is a confessional. Uh, it was actually in a show of confessionals. And I was thinking about uh, this idea that, that secrets are what give people power over us, right? And we're always scared that people are going to find out things about us, right? And uh, I figured that if you had this confessional, that when you confessed, I mean, this idea of setting yourself free, you confessed, you would do it in a glass box, and uh, everyone would be able to hear and see you confess. So once you put those things out there and everybody knew all the horrible secrets about you, there'd be nothing you'd be afraid of anymore. This also had a trailer hitch on it that I could pull around and let people confess with. Uh, this is at Claremont Graduate University. Um, I've always really been interested in waves and water and the structure of waves and water. Um, and uh, I wanted to do a piece that was just complete, uh, completely covered the room in these waves that you could walk around on. And it went up about nine feet in the back. And this is sort of funny because Claremont Graduate University is this really fancy university and all these graduate students were supposed to help me build this piece and I got there and they were like, they were very cool, these guys, and much cooler than I was. And uh, so I'm like trying to get them to help me, but all they would do is stand around and say things like, would you ever consider not using material to make sculpture? <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, actually I used to teach at this um, uh, what Chafee College, which is this two-year college in Rancho Cucamonga, and I would teach a summer class there every year. And so I couldn't get these graduate students to do anything. And uh, so I called up all these kids from this two-year college that were just like the greatest kids in the world, and they all just showed up, and we built this thing. And so it's always very humbling to me uh, that people are willing to help me build these things. Um, then when I was teaching down there, uh, I got asked to be in a show at uh, Huntington Beach 
Center for Contemporary Art or something like that. I can't remember what the name was. But uh, I only had two weeks to build this piece, and the only thing I had with me was a bandsaw and a table saw and a jigsaw. So I had to figure out how to build this out of Home Depot wood with a you know, grinder and a couple of things. So um, there, anybody familiar with the artist Via Selman? Um, well, this, I was asked to be in, we, they paired up artists, and I was in a room with her. And uh, so this piece was right next to, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the drawing of waves of water. So that, that was on the wall opposite this piece. So, <clears throat> um, I also do a lot of things where I go and work with students at different schools, and uh, I always have to figure out something that I can do with them. You know, some piece that I can make that they can be involved in as well. That uh, that, that will allow them to help. Um, and this is a piece that I did at Mount Hood Community College with the students there, where um, this is actually, it looks like five separate circles of wood, but it's actually um, one piece of wood that's joined together in this loop that keeps going around. So this is a thousand feet of li uh, linear feet of uh, laminated wood that's all connected. Um, and I was just, I was really interested in the idea of scale and creating scale with not much material. Um, and along those lines, I tapered all the bottoms of all the stands here, so they're just down to little points. Um, so the whole piece is supported on a, a space that's less than three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. Um, every once in a while, um, I like to get a show at a regular gallery sort of place that uh, will allow me to play around and think about different things. Um, so I sort of store up a bunch of ideas that, that can be turned into objects that aren't necessarily mm -hmm. installations on their own. And this was one of those shows. Um, the idea of the wings that people could wear, I mean, those things were sort of funny because when you put on wings, it's like you'd think it would like make you free, right? You put on these wings and you can fly around and stuff. But the wings that I carved weighed like 150 pounds, and they dig into your shoulder, and they were very painful. The odd thing about them was, though, you still felt like a superhero when you were wearing them, even though they were weighing you down. Um, so I made these that were um, out of steam-bent uh, wood, so they're hollow, so anybody could wear them. And you could go into the gallery and put them on and walk around and look at the rest of them when you were... So that was just one of the pieces in there. So... And they also would fold down like beetle shells. So they had bearings on them, but they were just on little racks that you could take off and wear. So my niece Bailey wearing one. He just was not big enough. <laughs> um, this is about the time when I started thinking about thorns. For the same reason I started thinking about uh, airplanes and boats. Uh, is because the reason I find them aesthetically pleasing or beautiful is because it, it's it's about their function, right? They're they're there to protect. So so the reason they're beautiful is because they're made to actually do something, right? Um, and again, this was a sort of a takeoff on the cart thing. So this actually balanced on just two points. So you could actually push it up and down and push it around the room. So which never tell people that because like I pushed this to the edge of engineering. So it supported itself, but it wouldn't take a lot of abuse. So of course people come in there and start you know, pushing it around. Yeah. Um, this is the first time I started doing uh, uh, these thorns in this show. And uh, this, these pieces, I went and I had the whole thing laid out and I put it all together and that space over there was missing something. I can't help thinking about the installation. So I, it was the weekend before the show, so I had to come up with another sculpture to do over the weekend that would fit in there. So I just started laminating pieces of wood and putting this together. And it actually turned out to be the most significant part of the show, which I find is quite true. The things that I usually have to crank out, things that have this sense of urgency, things that I don't think about or overthink tend to be a lot better than the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about. So, 
right. <clears throat> now, every once in a while, uh, you have to uh, clean things out, right? So I had a bunch of these pieces. I had an extra piece that from the, the Virginia Groot show. I had all the other pieces. And I decided I wanted to see if I could start from absolute zero, right? And I, should, I mean, if I'm a good enough artist, I should be able to start from zero with nothing and be just as good as I was before. So I decided to burn everything in my studio. So um, I took all these pieces and used the wings to light them. And uh, so I walked around with that. This is a performance piece called Icarus. And it, I don't know if you've ever done anything like this, but you get sort of worked up. And I got so excited that I started running into my studio and I grabbed everything. <laughs> Drawings and journals and all sorts of pieces and I burned up everything. It's something really cathartic about watching tens of thousands of hours of your work just go up in 45 minutes. Um, I also, you know, most of us who are artists can't really afford to just be artists. So for a long time, I was a cement contractor. I'm um, a pool trawler. I used to do the finished plastering coats on pools. So I decided to throw a little bit of that in there. So this is a piece at Franconia Sculpture Park. Uh, I was about 40 feet tall. And uh, I had to build a form there and trowel this all on, carrying up about 10,000 pounds of concrete in five gallon buckets. And I got there and I thought I was going to finish this in six days, but three weeks later I had to tell them I was coming back at the end of the summer. But, uh, oh, there's this piece. Uh, that was the structure to build it. So cover it all with expanded metal lath and trowel all the concrete on it. <laughs> Utterly absurd. It was ridiculous. Last time I really worked with concrete in art. So. Uh, this is a piece at Merrill Hurst University um, at the art gym. And I really sort of paid attention to the way I built this. So, I mean, I usually didn't show people how I built these things. But it started to become apparent to me that the process of building these things is almost more important than the finished piece. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of chaotic dance that takes place. And it's not just me. Like I said before, I find it very humbling the amount of people that are willing to help me on these things. So I would never be able to finish any of these things without all the different people that have helped me. Um, so this is what those floors look like underneath. And I'm just going to go through these real fast because it sort of shows a step-by-step -step of how these things get done. Has anybody ever been to the art gym? It's a very large space. Um, <clears throat> and they... I always, if I can, try to get shows that are at the end of the summer, right before fall starts, because there's usually nothing in there in the summer, so I can work in there over the summer. So we worked in here for about two and a half months building this piece. So. And you usually have to work on everything at once, so it gets really nuts in there. At one point, there was so much lumber up in the air holding this up that you almost couldn't see the other wall through the piece. And that's the finished piece. Um, I also have become aware that the process of obtaining materials and how I use materials is, I suppose, to any artist is important. But uh, all these pieces, I needed really long pieces of uh, two and a half by two and a half feet pieces of wood. So I had a neighbor, I lived out in Estacada, who had an old tree farm that, went, that they let go. And so he had all these trees that were like 60 feet tall that had no branches on them because they all grew up next to each other perfectly straight. So I uh, took those trees and I cut down about 30 of those trees and using a circular saw I cut these pieces of wood out of the trees. And uh, Home Depot is really good about taking back saws after you burn them out after a day and a half. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's, that's a three saw sculpture right there. Um, and this is based on this idea that is sort of related to the piece that's downstairs. Um, when I talked to Terry Hopkins at 
I said I wanted to do a boat that was just floating in the air above water, just floating there, just up in the air, floating there. So I was trying to figure out how to do that. I was, here's the thing, if you want to get some good shows and get people to like you, you should promise them impossible things. Because then when you end up doing them, then it gives you some credit. So, uh, so I was thinking about uh, you know physics books. You know how they describe the universe. There's always these drawings, and it's always like grid patterns. Like a black hole is this grid pattern that then all of a sudden it dives down in it like that. So I figured if I made the whole space a grid pattern, then this, the grid pattern becomes the air. So the boat's essentially floating in it anyway. Um, here's another funny thing about galleries. They always have these enormous, like the middle of this gallery is like 27 feet tall, but they always put the light tracks at like 14 feet. So we had to build the boat and everything all around the light track. So it goes through the boat in several places. But, uh, mm. And most of these things people can walk on. Um, it's pretty important generally to have people walk on these things for me. This is uh, at the Ogle Gallery uh, again. And uh, this was essentially me giving the last hurrah to the universal joint. Because I love the universal joint. It has nothing to do with the word universal. It has to do, again, with something that functions, right? Um, so I was really interested in that idea. Um, and so I wanted to do this exact replica of this universal joint that started all this one that I found in a bucket of water on a farm. Um, so that's about four feet tall. And then... I figured I wanted to figure out how to bend a six by six into a perfect 24 foot circle. And most of this is made out of old coal timbers. Uh, and then I got to show it a Siyama space up in Seattle. And uh, it's, it's a great, great space with a great group of people. And I wanted to do something that was really spectacular there, something that really took on the space. Um, but I had another show at uh, my undergraduate school in Minnesota that I was coming back as an alumni to do this thing. And uh, I wanted to figure out something that I could build for that show, but then also use in this other space because I didn't have enough time to do all of it. So I built this, uh, it's called Deviations from Plum. And, uh, Bethel College, this college I went to, is uh, it's a Christian college, and uh, back in the day when I went there, they used to have this committee, this sort of censorship committee, right? So whenever, before they put anything into the galleries, there was, it had to go before the censorship committee to see if there's anything offensive about it. So I thought, oh, they're going to have me back. I should do something, you know, funny. So... Uh, so I thought they were, I was, was going to, I was going to get there. I was going to put this thing up, and these thorns are very pointy. And, uh, but you had to walk around in them. And I thought I was going to put it up. So I, I, I hung, I made, there's 800 thorns, um, and I made 800 corks that hang from the end of all the thorns. So I thought uh, I was going to, they were going to go, hey, you can't have this, too dangerous. And I was going to say, you know, very snidely, well, there's uh, 800 corks hanging from those 800 thorns. You go make it as safe as you want. But... <laughs> It turns out they were just very nice, and I felt like an asshole. And, <laughs> but anyway, um, but I did put a safety center there, so in case you wanted to go walking through it without poking out your eyes, you could go to the safety center and put on a pair of goggles before you went through there. Um, and this is the piece that I proposed at Siyama Space. And I don't really build models, so I did this really terrible model drawing of it, gave it to them. But apparently they liked it enough that they gave me the show. But uh, so that was what I told them I was going to do. And again, here's some process stuff. There's Beth Seller. She's the uh, director. Um, and turns out I made this airplane. It was a half-scale DC-3. And... Uh, it had a 52-foot wingspan, which was bigger than the gallery, so we had to wedge it up at an angle and build it in place. So, and there's the body. I, 
I never, I always, it's always surprising to me because uh, I don't think they ever realize what they're getting themselves into because this is like a functioning architecture firm. So I was doing this while they were all, you know, doing their architecture. But, uh, and we slept on the floor in this gallery while we did it. A bunch of people from uh, Lewis and Clark where I used to teach uh, came up and helped. Um, so essentially when it was done, uh, I took those thorn branches that I made for that last show, added on another 15 feet onto them, so I had these 24 foot tall thorn branches with 1,800 thorns on them. And uh, all the thorns were carved on a lathe, and all the thorn buds were cast, um, and all the branches, it's so funny because the, the branches are um, lumber that I had that uh, I took, I ripped down, bent them on forms, and put them back together. So I'm taking this, I mean, it comes from the forest, these people rip it down into these planks, then I take the planks and I bend it back into trees, and then turned it back into these natural forms. It seems sort of ridiculous, but... Uh, and what's the casting material? Just hydrostone. Um, me and my wife, Kim, and our two daughters took a trip around the Sea of Cortez. It was all inspired by the book, The Log of the Sea of Cortez, by uh, John Steinbeck. So we got a sailboat and towed it all the way down to San Carlos and put it in the water and sailed around the Sea of Cortez for eight weeks. Um, <clears throat> and there was this uh, great experience I had that... Um, when we were camped, uh, camped, we were moored off the island of uh, Isla San Marcos, and uh, there was a storm coming, and we had to get off of the island because we were getting pushed into the shore, and it was all crazy wavy and stuff. But uh, the day before, me and Amelia were uh, in the water by this dead whale carcass, and there was a Humboldt squid around there, right? And I don't know if they're big and scary. So uh, during the night, our, we, I had too much anchor rowed out, and the boat drifted around and wrapped around some coral heads. So we were trying to get out of there during the storm and the waves, and it's, it's crazy. But I couldn't pull up the anchor because it was tied basically to these rocks on the bottom. So um, I waited till morning because I didn't want to go out when there was Humboldt squid because, you know, I didn't want to get killed. But uh, so the next morning I had to dive down on the anchor uh, to untie it from this thing. And Kim was driving the boat with the outboard motor on, and she was afraid she was going to run over me, and the boat's bouncing around, and I had to climb down there. And um, So I get down there, and it's crazy up top, but down at the bottom, there's nothing. There's, like, fish swimming around. It's, like, the calmest thing in the world. And while I was down there, I reached out and grabbed a handful of sand, and I stuck it in my cargo shorts uh, pocket. And I still have some of that. And some of my students that uh, I usually start out the semester by giving them a few grains of that specific sand. And it sort of makes me think that uh, these pieces, like, like that sand, are a record of my existence right, at that time. Um, so this is a piece based on, on that experience. Um, this is remember I did that thing in the gallery where they let me use it to use different ideas. So I uh, this is another one of those shows. And again, this is funny. Um, the best piece in the show turned out to be this, which was one that I had to make over a weekend because I needed something else in the space. Um, this one's called The Last Supper. It's a big target with these F-16s that are thrown like darts at it. Uh, this piece was called Dogfight. And there are two, uh, 
two F-16s on these things, and these are, they made these wheels out of cast porcelain, and so you could actually push these things around the room and chase each other with them. Um, but they were chained together and wrapped around this post with this wooden chain, which I get sort of hooked on things. Like, I got really fascinated by this idea of making wooden chain. So there's that. These uh, planes are actually still hanging up at Sayama Space. <laughs> okay, so the idea of the chain. So I, I get really obsessive about making these things. So I thought, you know, that was about 150 links to make that. So I thought I should make this thorn thing, but I also want to use this chain as sort of binding. So I never like to like leave a gallery the way it is. I always like to put in some architectural aspect of my own to change it some. So I took and built a new floor in the gallery at a, uh, about a 12 degree angle. So we had to start out by building the whole floor. This is, uh, these are two of my students, Kyle Thompson and Gustav. And uh, this is after we worked for, usually we go down and we do these things. I get these people to come with us. We drive straight to wherever the hell it is. And then we work 18, 20 hours a day and get these things done. They usually only have like four days to a week to get these things done. And this is after a couple of those days. So, so I decided I need 1,200 feet of wooden chain. So I had to make 3,300 3, links. And then we used uh, those, the chain to hold the piece in place. Good stuff. This was at um, the Schneider Museum in Ashland, Oregon. Um, and then based on that, I had, uh, this is a page out of my journal, and uh, the next piece that I'm going to show you is all based off this drawing. And I have to tell you a little story that uh, Beth Sellers, who's the director of uh, the Siyama space up in Seattle, um, was very kind to me in reading a grant application that I put in. I asked her if she'd read it, and it was the last minute, and could she really do it? And she's a very busy person. So... Um, she spent three hours editing this thing for me, and then, but I had already sent it in. So basically, I wasted three hours of her time and felt so bad about it that I ripped this page out of my journal and I sent it to her. And I said, this is my favorite journal page, and I'm sorry. So she has that now. So um, I had to figure out how to make that. Um, so I made these wooden tubes. Oh, I don't know. I'll show you. These are these thorns, but I wanted them all to be different and uh, have sort of a naturalistic curve. So they're all made out of I don't know, ten-sided tubes that were tapered, then cut at an angle, and then twisted and glued back together. Kyle Thompson. So they were pretty complicated to make, but uh, I don't, you don't really think about how much work they're going to be when you're like, oh, I'll just do it that way. It'll be a snap. We'll just crank them right out. And that was the branch. They were like uh, 16 feet tall. And this is, again, after we finished putting them up. <laughs> Students work so hard for so long. That's uh, the San Jose Institute for Contemporary Art. Uh, I'm just going to gloss over this. I don't know why this is in here, but uh, this is a thing I did at Lewis and Clark um, for the inauguration of the new president. And we were asked to do something, again, that I could work with students that, we could, that they could all help with. So we made these inflatable lotuses. Look who it is. <laughs> so, I'll go through these quick. So. 
Nice campus out there. I don't think there are other things that we used to do. Um, I really like to uh, get the students to do ridiculous things too. So we usually built airplanes in our classes and then we'd have to go run around the campus with them and have dog fights and pretend we're flying them. So. I, th I always figured it was my job to embarrass them as much as I could. You know, it's good to get all that stuff over with. Get embarrassed really early in life and then later. You don't have to worry about it so much. Uh, this is uh, for the Boise Art Museum. Um, this it was a, the largest thing I ever built, and I really had to be able to figure out a way to measure it. <clears throat> and this is a, a one inch to one foot scale drawing of the gallery. And uh, so the, the gallery is 97 feet by 45 feet. And I, like an idiot, said, oh, is that all the space I get? Um, so I said, can I use the courtyard and this other gallery, too? So um, the piece actually went off through the wall of the gallery, through another gallery, through a wall, and then back around. And this is the calculations it took to figure out how to get that. Um, ellipse right. Um, and a friend of mine, who was a student of mine, uh, Kyle Thompson, uh, was really good at math, so he helped me a lot with that. And uh, so, but he was, he's also a commercial fisherman, so he was going off to do his commercial fishing, and I'm like, how am I going to figure this out if you're not here? And he goes, don't worry about it, man. He goes, here. So he wrote this down and gave it to me and said, hey, if you get lost, just use this. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not use that. <laughs> he made a spreadsheet for me about it. <laughs> so, um, to build that ellipse, I had to make 24 separate pieces of wood that were bent at a very specific angle. So I had to figure out a way to make this uh, jig to bend these things. So then there were seven ply laminates uh, to make this big circle. And uh, now I'm sort of an idiot. Uh, and I originally thought, I'm going to make three of these circles in here. So I actually made enough material to make three of these circles, which I did not use. Um, and I had to figure out how to make, well, I'll just shut up. Students, again, very helpful. So this is in the gallery. So all those laminated pieces of wood became this ellipse that was 90 some feet across. And then we had to skin the whole thing and then lift it 147 foot piece into place at one time. Which was pretty crazy to lift that. Um, I stood in the middle and just by eye looked at it and then we had seven points around the thing. They were all with block and tackles and come alongs and all sorts of stuff and I'd be like, Jim, up two inches, Thad, down two inches and it was crazy. Um, that um, there was, I had an NEA grant for and a Paul G. Allen grant for so I was able to fly friends of mine from all over the country in to help and they put us up in a hotel for two weeks. and. But that one did just about kill me, I'll have to admit. Um, I didn't make any work for a year after I made this piece. I was so stressed out that I was like, while I was cutting pieces on the table saw, I didn't think I was going to be able to get it finished. And I'm like, thinking I'm having a heart attack while I'm cutting stuff on the table saw. I'm just like, push through it. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. <laughs> so... Uh, so... Well, that's the finished piece. So it... You can see it goes up and around through 22 foot ceilings and goes up through the window and back around through another gallery. <coughs> All right. All right, I'll go through this back. I'm going to get to how it happened this summer. Oh, here's the scariest thing in the world. We got the whole thing up, right? Like, everybody's waiting for this thing to go up. There's all this talk about it. it's going to be crazy. And we get it up, but um, because 
we built this piece separately outside, you know, with moisture and all, it expanded, it got bigger. So when we set the whole thing up, it didn't line up. And it was like right through the window. And we had to do some fancy figuring, but I was just about losing it at that point. But uh, anyway, it worked out fine. Okay, here we go. Finally, the summer. Oh, it's a short amount of time left. Um, so I went out to Franconia Sculpture Park this summer to build this piece, and I liked the piece I did at Boise so much, I thought, wow, that 97-foot across circle, I'd really love to see that standing straight up in the air outside. So um, I went out there and built all these structures out of rebar, which I learned later I probably shouldn't have used, but... Uh, so I had to build these structures. This thing's 40 feet across the circle. And then this functions the same way those laminate beams did in the last piece, where I had wooden circles on there that then I was going to uh, nail wood to. So there's those. And that's me building it. Um, this is a bunch of people helping me put it up. I, like I said before, once again, I do not build these things by myself. I, and I, I'm very humbled by the fact that people will continue to help me do these ridiculous things. So there we are lifting it up in the air. So that is the piece up in the air. Um, and it was going to be this freestanding thing, right? So we get it done, it's all great, you know, it's just being held, it just stands up there and moves slightly in the breeze like that. And I get it all done, working like 16 hours a day for like a month to get this thing done. So I'm at my brother's house who lives in St. Paul, and he, uh, so I was staying there, and I'm just about to leave. I just packed up my truck, felt satisfied it was all done and everything, and I get a call, and it's John Hawk at the park, who's the director of the park, says, your piece fell over. Um, so that's what the bottom of it looked like in the end. Uh, and so this 40 foot tall, 2,000 pound thing fell over, landed on one of their welders. It just, yeah, right. It was, it was a pretty interesting experience for me. I've never had anything completely come apart like that before. Um, and the th it ended up being a beautiful thing uh, because I always think about, I thought of it as like my greatest failure, but it was this thing that it happened. It fell, up, it fell over and... Um, I had had a couple other setbacks that year, uh, and so I was feeling very vulnerable. And this thing, I thought it was great. I was like, it was like heroic. I got it up, and I'm like, yes. And then, of course, it falls over, and everything comes apart. And I got up there, and I looked at it. And when I got up there, it had landed on this welder, and then hit the ground. So the frame, the structure was all bent, and it almost destroyed this welder. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I just all of a sudden got this calm feeling and thought, you know, there's nothing generally so broken that you can't fix it. And I just went, well, let's fix it. So I spent the next three weeks fixing it. And, uh, but the, the greatest thing was that I used to live in Minnesota and I had all these friends there that when they heard this happened, it was, it was like wave after wave of people came to help me. And it just became this really sort of redemptive, thing, right, where I was able to take this thing that had been destroyed, when initially when I got it up, I'm like, it's the greatest thing I ever built, and, uh, and then it fell down. So, I, these are some reinforcements. I had to pull the whole thing apart, pull all the wood off of it, added a lot more structure into it, and I had made all these fancy joints to join the thing together so I could take it apart and then after it fell over, I'm like, no way. So I just welded everything together. Uh -huh. um, and I built these 40-foot tall, 41-foot tall steel structures. And put that on there. These, this also has a monitoring station at it. These seven 24-foot tall towers with uh, six-watt LEDs on the top of them and these speakers and these tubes that, uh, that point at the piece. So whenever... Every seven seconds, these, the lights flash and the speakers make a thumping sound. But since it's, these tubes are directed at the piece, the only 
place that you can really hear the sound and see the lights are directly in front of the piece or directly behind the piece. <clears throat> Um, these I just threw in because there's some things that I'm thinking about right now. Uh, the idea of how stress affects material, affects people. Uh, these are something I was working on again with a friend of mine, Kyle Thompson, who was a former student of mine, where we'd take and we'd make these structures, but the only way that they're held together is by the tension of the come along, and we just keep pulling them until it destroys the, st the structure. So they're not fastened together in any way except this pressure pulling them together from one point. Um, this is sort of sad, but I threw this in there because I thought it was uh, PowerPoint savvy. This is actually a video that is not videoing. Now it's just an image. Um, but my eventual goal is to figure out how to make a wooden wave floor like I've been making, but one that will actually move that you can walk on. And this is a cam system that I developed that as it spins, it's going to push the floor up and down so you'll be able to walk on it. It's, look, it's a lot more impressive when it's actually moving. But, uh, uh, this is another thing I'm working on right now. It's a, this is a, a chair that's based on um, a rocking chair that was my great, great, great grandmother's chair. Um, and uh, so I made templates and, and uh, all sorts of jigs for making the parts for this chair. And this is a copy of the chair. Um, that I eventually want to make a thousand of them. And they're all going to be uh, placed on an electronic grid that runs by a computer program that, like wind blowing across grass, you know, where you see it and it goes like this, sort of catches up with itself. But they're all going to be hooked to that, so this computer program. So the chairs will all rock like a wind blew across them. Um, this is a picture. My daughter's on her boat. Uh, this is on the Sea of Cortez, where we were, as we were sailing across, um, back from the Bay of Conception, um, we got followed by this pod of dolphins. There's like 4,000 dolphins. Possibility of a search. And I always like to throw this. This is us. The, the guy we met, that's his boat. His name was Jack Hero. So this is us chasing Jack Hero across the Sea of Cortez. And then I have one more thing I'm going to read here. Actually, two more things. Um, George Breck. Uh, as a fluxus artist, um, and he did a thing called uh, Two Exercises. And th I've read this for a long time. Actually, one of my students, Gustav, read this in one of my classes. And it's this exercise where it says, consider an object. Call what is not the object other. Add to the object from the other to create a new object and a new other. And that may be a little confusing, but I started thinking about this idea of making art and, and where art and where, where art ends and life begins. And you start out being this person who, you know, you go to school, you start making art, and then more and more of your life comes into this. And, and there comes a point when you can't separate the art from your life. And then I'm just going to read this last thing. And then you have any questions in the last five minutes? Uh, this is called the Rule of Saint Benedict. <clears throat> Attend to these instructions. Listen with heart and mind. They are provided in the spirit of goodwill. The words are addressed to anyone who is willing to renounce the delusion that the meaning of life can be learned. Whoever is ready to take up the greater weapon of fidelity to a way of living that transcends understanding. The first rule is simply this. Live this life and do whatever is done in the spirit of thanksgiving. 
Abandon attempts to achieve security. They are futile. Give up the search for wealth. It is demeaning. Quit the search for salvation. It is selfish. And come to the comfortable rest in the certainty that those who participate in this life with an attitude of thanksgiving will receive its full promise. Do you have any questions? Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I let them do it. Sometimes I'm too tired by the end of the thing and I'm just like, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been to Burning Man. I've seen, yeah, I've seen pictures of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why would? Why would? Ah, because I think it's the hardest material to work with. Usually, that's a challenge. Um, no, I think it's uh, the reason I like it is because there's there's sort of a ritualistic sense in the tools that you use. You have to keep them sharp. You have to take care of them. Uh, there's there's different kinds of fasteners for wood. Um, so many different relative things about wood. The types of wood, uh, the relative dryness of the wood, um, the density of the wood, the age of the wood. Um, I just have not. I found that it's for me anyway about the most challenging thing to work with. Yeah, I just appreciated the aesthetic of them. I found one in a bucket of water on a farm once, and it was so caked with rust that I took it and uh, I sandblasted it, and it seemed very sculptural to me, and I was really just interested in it aesthetically. Yeah. Each wood is each link is done separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were talking about how it's limited to like, you know, what I did in that forty five seconds, you know, watching your face. <laughs> how do you feel an hour afterwards? Knowing that everything is gone. Were you still exhilarated or was it more of a oh my god, what did I do? No, I felt pretty good. No. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I love the fact that stuff gets my stuff gets destroyed and doesn't stay around for a long time because, like, you know, that, that thing that I did at the Boise Art Museum, it was like 90 feet across, but when I tell people about it in a year, it was 120 feet across. <laughs> yeah? um, I love the idea of legend and storytelling, right? And when I exaggerate and tell people that things were bigger than they were, that's completely legitimate because they were not there. Right? They didn't smell the wood. They didn't have the thing towering over them. So in order for me to get the, give them the sense of what it was really like, I've got to exaggerate. Right? So it's better than having something there as a historical fact that people can go see. Like I went and saw the, we went to Europe and we went and saw the Colosseum, right? And I've seen that thing in so many movies, right? Gladiator and all this stuff. And you get to the Colosseum and it like ruined it for me because I get there and I'm like, I thought it would be bigger. You know? So... So it's better when it's destroyed and there's stories about it. Yeah. Are you ever going to explain the piece to the Archer Gallery? Am I ever going to explain it? Yes. What would you like to explain about it? I wondered with, with the wave pattern and the new form. And like... um, well, I, I, I'm really interested in creating contexts that are a little obscure um, and I work pretty intuitively. I started out with that passage from the Graham Greene novel that's down there. Um, and then I've been, that, that photograph is of me and my brother and my grandfather, and I've been really fascinated by that photograph for a long time. And I started thinking about that quote and that photograph, and uh, it came to me that this idea of this ripple in this water would be apropos to that. And so it's really about the relationship of that quote, that photograph, and that image. And um, 
I'd like to create context that I don't give a lot of answers to. Um, I like it to be emotionally compelling enough that somebody can come to it and be reminded about something in their own life. And then the, the, the thing that puts it all together for them is some experience that they've had. So it becomes relevant to them and not just to me. I mean, the, the piece of Siyama space, the thorns, the water, the airplane, makes no real sense. Right? But it's these sort of overwhelming, emotionally compelling images jammed together in this unlikely situation that hopefully will trigger something in somebody else's memory. Right? So it just becomes, essentially it's a context. It sounds like a work like a myth. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so you've been an educator for almost as long as you've been an artist yeah. and renowned for both. And I'm wondering like, how those things line up for you. Um, like, what role, what impact one lays on the other and kind of how you think about your place in both of them. Um, well, I mean, I, I taught at Lewis and Clark for like 10 years and I'm not doing that anymore. And it's, it's sort of a new experience for me. Uh, Cause it's been, like I said, it's been a long time since I've not just made art, or not taught and made art. Um, and I don't know, I'm still trying to figure it out, uh, what that means to me. I, I know it's pretty important because I use my students as, you know, guinea pigs. You know, to make them do unreasonable things and, you know, just ridiculous things. And, and teaching was an amazing thing for me because, especially teaching art, right? Because there's no real curriculum or any way that you're supposed to do it. So it's essentially, half the time I'd go in there with just stuff I thought about the night before. You know, one time I made them make drums and out of dog rawhides. And so we made drums and then we took name tags that just said art on them. And we walked around campus beating on the drums, yelling, look at me, look at me. Um, I don't know. I, I really like teaching a lot. Uh, I get a lot of energy from the students. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what it's like not teaching for a while. But uh, I don't know if that answers the question. I guess I haven't even really figured it out yet. But uh, yeah. yeah. Did you get that grant? Which grant? Did you get the grant that um, where you get oh, from your church? Oh, um, I didn't get it that year, but I got it the next year. <laughs> Thank you.